Well, thank you, Senator Kirk, and, and certainly thank you from FDD, and thank you from FPI, our, our co-sponsor for this briefing, for, for your leadership. Um, and it was a senior European official who, who said to me the other day that there, there is no technical algorithm that can solve a strategic problem. And the strategic problem is, is the nature and the conduct of this Iranian regime. And there's no technical solution that is ultimately going to stop Iran from pursuing nuclear weapons when the regime itself is involved in a terror abroad and terror at home. And so with that, I want to um, take the opportunity to introduce you to our panelists. We're going to have a, a chat about this issue, and then Congressman Ted Deutsch will be here in about half an hour for his remarks, and then we'll continue with, with a Q&A. Uh, first to my left is Dr. Katrina Lantos-Sweat. She's the Vice Chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. She's the President and CEO of the, of the Lantos Foundation for Human Rights and Justice. And, and like uh, Senator Kirk, I welcome um, her mom, uh, Annette Lantos, and her husband, who's here, Ambassador Dick Sweat, who are here with us today. Thank you. Welcome to, to both of you. Also joining us is my colleague on the far right, uh, Ali Alfane, who is an, an Iran expert. Uh, he's written books on the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. He follows the activities of the Guards, both internationally and domestically, uh, as well as the activities of Iran's Ministry of Intelligence Services. And uh, right next to me is Arshan Parsi. He's the founder and head of the Iranian Railroad for Queer Refugees, an international human rights organization based in Toronto. Um, that's my hometown, Toronto, so it's nice to see a, a fellow Canadian here. Um, he focuses on addressing Iranian human rights abuses against the LGBT community. So with that, Dr. Lantos, Sweat, may I ask you to kick off the conversation where each panelist will talk for about five minutes and then we're, we're going to open it up to Congressman Ted Deutsch and to a discussion with all of you. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, it's my great pleasure to be here with you today and um, as Senator Kirk said, I always feel humble when I'm in the presence of my mother because she really has been a human rights hero for many decades in this capital and in capitals around the world, but I'm also very humbled to be here with a lot of heroic individuals who have been fighting this fight on behalf of human rights in Iran. And so thank you for letting me join you. I think in a big picture sense, there are two key dangers that we are dealing with um, from a policy perspective as a country when we deal with Iran. The first is the, the danger, um, and, and the title of the panel today sort of um, alludes to this, the, the title of Dashed Hopes, is the temptation that we have to be misled by certain superficial and even symbolic markers of reasonableness um, in the leadership of a country that bear no relation to reality. I think we can see that danger and that quicksand writ large in the case of Assad in Syria. For so many years, people said, well, he's a reformer. You know, He's somebody who we can look to to bring reform to Syria. And in some senses, that was driven by the most superficial of observations. He was Western educated. He had a modern looking wife. He spoke English well. And we sort of tended to rely on those things as somehow a, a kind of comfort that perhaps this was someone who would move things in a positive direction. An even greater threat, which is distinct, I think, to Iran is um, we are in danger of being misled by our desire for the deal. Um, I don't know, there may be some women in this audience, I doubt there are many men, but there's a, a TV show that my daughters love to watch called Say Yes to the Dress. And okay, I, I'm seeing a few smiling faces out there, and it's one of these kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, you wouldn't exactly call it a reality show, but it's about young women looking to buy a wedding dress, and all the sort of desire that they bring to that process that sometimes leads them to say yes to bad deals, to very bad deals. Well, we have deal desire in our relationship with Iran. There's a lot at stake, and obviously preeminent among all the various things at stake is our desire to have a deal on the nuclear program. But deal desire can lead you down a dangerous path. It can lead you to a bad deal, a deal you ultimately regret. And I think that that is very much at play in the dynamics of how we evaluate the current regime, how we evaluate the deal that's being offered and is on the table. And so what I'd like to do is focus very quickly on 
the religious freedom aspect of human rights in Iran, because I think it gives us a window into the credibility of this, this uh, government that we are trying to deal with. Um, we often say at USERV that how a society deals with religious freedom is the proverbial canary in the coal mine. And um, this canary is not telling a very good story. The beliefs defining the Iranian dictatorship's character remain self-consciously religious and inescapably theocratic. Any Iranian dissenting from its interpretation of Shia Islam may be considered an enemy of the state and a potential target for abuse. Since 1999, the U.S. annually has designated Iran as a country of particular concern, or CPC. Its government continues to rank among the world's worst religious freedom abusers, subjecting Iranians to prolonged detention, torture, and executions based primarily or entirely on the religion of the accused. Because religion matters to Tehran, how the government treats the right to religious freedom is critical to assess the overall status and direction of human rights. That lens also is necessary to evaluate Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, who took office last August. The picture is bleak. Iran's already poor religious freedom conditions have deteriorated during Rouhani's tenure, particularly for Baha'is, Zoroastrians, Christians, Jews, and Muslims belonging to minority Sufi and Sunni sects. Dissidents and human rights defenders increasingly have been targeted and several executed for, quote, waging war against God. Even members of Iran's Shia Muslim majority have been targeted, including Ayatollah Mohammed Kazemini Burujerdi, and I brought his photo with me today, like Senator Kirk. I believe it's so important to put a face to the names of these victims. He is a Shia clerk, an advocate for religion and state separation and the rights of Iran's religious minorities and its Shia Muslim majority. He was arrested in October 2006, sentenced to death on charges including, again I quote, enmity against God. The death sentence was appealed and withdrawn, but he is currently serving 11 years in prison and suffering from physical and mental abuse. Of course, we know Baha'is and Christians in particular face increased arrests um, and persecution. The number of Baha'i prisoners has increased under Rouhani with at least 135, nearly twice the number that existed in 2011, imprisoned because of their religious beliefs. This past May marked six years that seven Baha'i leaders, I won't show all their pictures now because I know time is short, have been incarcerated. Baha'is are mistreated in most facets of life, with babies incarcerated with their mothers. Baha'is barred from attending colleges and universities, from starting their own schools and establishing houses of worship to raise their children in their faith. They're prohibited from serving in the military. They face job bias everywhere. Authorities also do not recognize Baha'i marriages, and Iran's media demonizes them, enforcing their pariah status. When Baha'is die, their relatives cannot inherit their property. They have difficulty obtaining death certificates and often witness their graves being desecrated. Iran's Revolutionary Guards have begun ex excavating a Baha'i cemetery in which are buried 10 women the government hanged in 1983. They were convicted of crimes that included teaching children's classes. The women had chosen to die rather than renounce their faith. And taking their cue from the regime and the media, extremists have attacked Baha'i property in several cities. And in August 2013, a local Baha'i leader, Atoala Rezvani, was killed for his faith. No one has been charged with his murder. I see from our lovely timekeeper that my time is nearly up. I have a lot more to say, but I will reserve those comments for our discussion period. And thank you again for allowing me to join you today. Thank you very much, Katrina. It, it's worth noting as well that, um, as Katrina mentions, the rate of executions, the rate of imprisonments have actually accelerated since the election of President Rouhani. I, I would just note, before turning it over to the other speakers, that it, I believe there's only been one human rights designation um, by the U.S. government since the election of President Rouhani. So something that we should keep in mind is the rate of human rights abuses accelerates the U.S. government despite ample authority to crack down on the abusers has only actually issued one designation. We'll turn it over to, uh, to Ali Alphane from, from FDD. Ali? 
Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for providing me with this opportunity to share my uh, analysis uh, video. Uh, most unfortunately, for a very, very long time, uh, the political elites in Washington have been sending the wrong signals to Tehran, particularly to the Iranian public. Uh, the sole issue of interest to Washington has been the nuclear issue. Uh, and now there seems to be a lot of activity in order to reach an agreement. Uh, when it comes to the, to, to the human rights issue, we do not see the same degree of interest. Now, the signal that issue sends to the Iranian public is that as long as the threat emanating from the Islamic Republic is targeting the United States and U.S. allies, the U.S. cares. But when it comes to the security and human rights of Iranian citizens, there is not so much interest. What Senator Kirk has done, what you all are doing right now, is to correct that message, sending the right message to the Iranian public, telling them they do have friends here in America. Among them, some Iranians who are champions of human rights, particularly Dr. Mehran Gizakar, who is honoring us with her presence here today. When it comes to Mr. Rouhani and his presidency, most unfortunately, the human rights issue was not a part of his discourse in the course of the campaign for presidency in Iran. The sole issue that Dr. Rouhani was discussing with the Iranian public was to improve the economic standards in Iran in order to provide a better living for Iranian citizens. And the key he stressed again and again in the presidential campaigns and debates on television was that it was a precondition to improve the economy that Iran's, Iran reaches some kind of agreement in the nuclear issue with the 5 plus 1 group. After he was elected into office, uh, President Rouhani has made some encouraging statements. Uh, also, a couple of members of his government and the team of his advisors have been sending very, very encouraging uh, signals. Uh, President Rouhani himself, uh, on the uh, day celebrating uh, women. It is not 8th of March in Iran. We celebrate Women's Day on another day. Uh, Supreme Leader Khamenei was saying that Iranian women should stay at home and produce more kids, uh, making the Shia community ever greater. Mr. Rouhani, on the other hand, made a public speech in which he said that there was no need for Iranian women to stay at home just to raise children. Iranian women, of course, should be active in shaping the Iranian society. We have Mr. Ali Younesi, uh, who is a former intelligence minister and now presidential advisor. He has been extremely active advocating for improvement of conditions of life and political and social rights of religious minorities, particularly the Sunni community. Of course, there is no mention of the Baha'i community. And those who convert to Christianity. The evangelical Christian society, but at least, you know, he talks about the Sunnis, Sunni minority and their rights. And we have Mr. Ali Jannati, the Minister of Culture and Islamic Propagation, who has consistently been talking about improving access to internet, to making, uh, providing a more high-speed internet to the Iranian public, uh, and also about freedom of the press. Now, these things are very, very good and optimistic. However, we also are so unfortunate that none of these wishes and declared policy goals are being realized. There are no specific government initiatives in order to improve the things that President Rouhani and his associates are talking about. When it comes to women's rights, which legal initiatives did the president take in order to improve the conditions, particularly legal condition of women, ever since he came to office? The question is now. When it comes to political freedoms and freedom of speech, we have seen closure of three newspapers and one weekly magazine ever since Mr. Rouhani and his fairly progressive Minister of Culture came to office. In other words, we hear a lot of very, very nice words, a lot of encouraging messages from the Rouhani administration. But the Rouhani administration has most unfortunately not delivered and not made any move in order to improve those conditions. To make things worse, a closer look as, at President Rouhani's track record 
as a politician and statesman in the history of the Islamic Republic gives you even more worrying signs. Mr. Rouhani for many, many years served as the Sec Secretary of the Supreme National Security Council. In that position, Mr. Rouhani was instrumental in cracking down any dissidents against the regime. In 1999, the great student uprisings of the Khatan era, it was Mr. Rouhani who publicly defended the regime's killing of student act activists. It was Mr. Rouhani who must have been involved in assassination of Iranians abroad in his position as Secretary of the, Secretary of the Supreme National Security Council in the 1990s. And also, do not forget that Mr. Rouhani's associates, particularly many of his cabinet ministers, are former officials of the intelligence ministry. Mr. Rouhani's government, most unfortunately, is not a reformist government. It is making the right signals. However, we are not seeing those signals and those declared policy objectives being uh, turned and realized into real legislation. And therefore, we certainly believe that he needs some help, both from the Iranian society and from abroad. Pressure which forces Dr. Rouhani to make right choices. And I think this is one of the reasons we are gathered here today. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. So next we're going to turn to, to Arsha and Parsi to talk about uh, the regime's abuses of the LGBT community. And I want to actually uh, specifically acknowledge the work of my colleague at FTD, Ben Wienthal, whose um, tireless work on, on this issue and exposing the, the abuses of the, the LGBT community in Iran um, has been something that the organization has certainly supported and we will continue to support. It's, it's critical, particularly for, for an English language audience, that, that people understand the extent of those abuses. And we're very, very happy to have Arshem here to talk about his experience. Arshem. Uh, good evening, and it's such a pleasure to be here in DC again among you. And I, I would like to, first of all, thank the FDD and uh, FBI to, you know, to help me to be here. Uh, as I said, you know, my name is Arsham Parsi, and I'm an Iranian homosexual, and I'm an uh, LGBT rights activist. When I say I'm an LGBT rights activist, it means that uh, I support women rights, because we have a lot of women are lesbians. It means that I support you know, you know, religious minority rights, because a lot of you know, Jew Iranian Jewish or Iranian Christian or Iranian Baha'is are part of you know, their LGBT as well. It means that I'm you know, advocating and supporting you know, Political rights because a lot of LGBTs are politically politically active. So, I'm in another sense I'm helping and I'm promoting human rights for all Iranians. Um, I'm the executive director of the Iranian Railroad for Queer Refugees because our organization specifically help Iranian LGBTs who are facing persecution on the basis of their sexual orientation or gender identity and escape Iran and seeking asylum. A lot of people, you know, were persecuted in Iran on the basis of their sexual orientation. According to Human Group, which was a Stockholm-based group since 1979, which was an Islamic revolution, until 2000, Iranian government executed 4,000 people because of, for being gay. And sometimes I believe that maybe all of those 4,000 people were not homosexual, and the government used that title and crime to execute them and, you know, for the, you know, killing the opposition. And uh, today is the anniversary of the you know, President Rouhani's you know, election. And I, and I think I just want to make a remark that this is the anniversary of Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei's marriage. Because uh, in my idea, in my opinion, is Supreme Leader getting married to President. And all of them, they have a, you know, like a honeymoon. And for the first year, you know, everything is fine. Supreme Leader give them a chance, just talk. And after a year, their fight is going to be started. And as <laughs> Ali mentioned, uh, they're starting you know, fighting. You know, the Supreme Leader says something, and the President says something else. And I think right now, it's very important, especially for me as part of you know, a minority in Iran, that you know, we have a negotiation you know, five plus one and, uh, you know, from the Western countries. And I think Iran, I believe Iran's only issue is not nuclear program, it's human rights. And I think human rights should be on, on the agenda 
because it's about all Iranians' rights. It's no matter that Iran has a nuclear program or not, we as an Iranian need you know, our basic rights. And a lot of people escaping Iran to have just a basic rights, you know, rights to live, and you know, it's a matter of life and death. And I think it's very important to more focus more on human rights aspect, and uh, because it's it's a broad issue. When we talk about human rights, nuclear program is is a human rights you know issue as well. And I and I think you know I just want to save more of my time for the discussion because I I prefer to have you know to hear your comments and have an initiation as well. So thank you so much. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so while we're waiting for uh, Congressman Deutsch to come, let's let's open the discussion. And um, Katrina, maybe I could start with you. Um, I think, as folks, particularly on the Hill, know, the um, the passage of of Sasada in 2010 was the first time that the U.S. government actually began to focus on on Iran human rights and and violations of religious freedom, using um, instruments of designation of sanctions to go after Iranian abusers of human rights. Talk, talk to me a little bit about your your view of both Sasada and a companion piece of legislation called the Iran Threat Reduction and Syrian Human Rights Act, which was passed in 2012. Are these are these important instruments of of U.S. authority? If so, why? If not, what else could we be doing in terms of government and congressional authority to do, to, to do more? Well, I think they are potentially very important. Um, from my perspective, I would say they've been underutilized. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, that the provisions of these laws have only been used thus far to designate one Iranian official for sanctioning, and I um, I believe it is uh, that on May 23rd, actually, the Treasury announced, which we welcome, sanctions against Morteza Tamadon uh, for being involved in censorship and other activities limiting the freedoms of expression and assembly. Um, and this is also the individual who is um, uh, responsible for having orchestrated a series of coordinated arrests and abuses against Christian converts in 2011. Um, I and think Katrina, just sorry, just to clarify, I think we're both saying the same thing, but it's it's only one designation since the election of President Rouhani. Yes. There were other designations preceding his yes. election, but yes. only one since since last year. Yes, and um, obviously there are many more worthy targets of designation. Um, and I think that it is, uh, I think it's frustrating. I know it's frustrating to Congress. It's frustrating to the people who passed this legislation that it is used so sparingly. The point in giving an administration the tools with which to identify, to name, to shame, to target, and to sanction gross abusers of human rights is for them to use those tools. They are not only meaningless, but they tend to be something of a mockery if they're left there on the table. And I think we've seen too much of that. But um, the value and importance of, of, of CISADA and the more recently passed Iran Threat Reduction and Syria Human Rights Act is that it puts our Congress on the record as frankly being more forward-leaning than um, the administration. And it tends to have the effect, I think, at least somewhat of holding um, feet to the fire. And so, you know, certainly from my perspective, I think from USERF's perspective, we would encourage more robust usage of the tools that are at the disposal of the administration. And I think, um, and, and I want to echo what my colleague said down there, that when we, when we compartmentalize, when we put human rights in its own little silo, and we say, we're going to deal with this separately, we're going to address religious freedom separately, and when we've managed to get our big deal done on, on you know, nuclear issues, then maybe we'll turn our attention. We do not strengthen our hand, we weaken our hand. And shame on us if we do not take advantage when we are at a negotiating table and when things that Iran very much wants are on the table. Shame on us if we do not use that leverage to bring human rights considerations into the discussion. I am a huge believer in linkage. My late father was a huge believer in linkage. We all know that human rights are the soft targets and it's always easy to put them off in their own little corner. It's when the hard target goals are at the table that you have to bring the human rights issues in because that's when you have the leverage to get something done. And that would certainly be the, the um, approach that I would recommend. And I see that Congressman Deutsch has arrived.